Before we get started, I just wanted to take a moment and express a tiny fraction of the stupendous gratitude I have towards everyone who has helped so far to make Age of Mana Trains a thing. Launching this Patreon and YouTube channel has been nerve-wracking, to say the least, and I was blown away by how well the reception was. It's touching to know that I and our collaborating creatives not only have each other's backs, but that so many of you do as well. 23,000 views. 4,000 subscribers, and close to 100 patrons in three days. That's completely wild, and it gives me hope that this crazy idea could become a reality one day. I hope we can live up to all the excitement and create a world worth watching. So thank you all so much, and now let's begin. I'd say I'm somewhat knowledgeable in some things, like drawing and taking people off as wrecking ball. One thing I will readily say that I'm not knowledgeable in is science. Sure, I research it constantly for my art and I've always been obsessed with it, but I've never taken up science as an academic or professional field and thus will never claim to be any sort of expert in it. That said, I feel like talking about an alternate timeline of the Earth where monotremes rule while other mammals die out would be incomplete without actually talking about what monotremes are like. These mammals are not only wholly unique within our class, but they're also quite difficult to study, both in the wild and in captivity. Not to mention their fossil record is pretty poor. Such factors mean that a good deal of info about them is not easily accessible or, you know, in existence. This means fundamental facts, which are common knowledge concerning other animals like what colors they can see, or whether they have a stomach, take some digging to find. So for this video, I'd like to share all the relevant information on the monotremes I've been able to find over the past couple of years. Just so we're on the same page as far as where I'm basing all these speculative evolution premises off of. Once again, I am not a scientist. I am an artist. I'm not an expert. Please do your own research. I provided all my sources below and would encourage you to check them out yourself to learn more. With a clearer view of what monotremes are like and their evolution, we can have a clearer path in imagining a version of our world as if it were theirs. I knew they were interesting, but before learning all this, I had no idea how amazing they actually were. Before we get into super senses and defective organs, let's get a lay of the land first. Monotremes are the oldest of the three orders within the crown group Mammalia. Of the roughly 6,500 mammal species alive today, only five are monotremes. They're not just cousins of mammals or a separate branch on the tree of life, they're true mammals, united with us and opossums alike by these four traits. It's worth noting, especially since they're often thought of as a primitive or lesser group than the other mammals, but they've been evolving right alongside our ancestors for millions of years. We don't know the exact ancestor of all monotremes, but based on genetic and fossil evidence, such a species probably lived between 180 and 200 million years ago. This is old, like really old, like Pangaea was starting to break up old. T-Rex lived closer in time to you and me than to the ancestor of all monotremes. With no fossils from that time, however, the oldest fossils we know from these mammals come from the early Cretaceous of Australia. Steropodon, Colicodon, Tynolophus, plus three new genera only found in 2024. Known mainly from just teeth and jawbones, they're some of the oldest members of this group we know of. During the early Cretaceous, these animals thrived in Australia, at a time when it was fused to Antarctica at the hip, with winters plunged into months of continuous night. Many of the adaptations we know them for today likely evolved as a response to this sort of environment, where food was submerged and light was poor. However, we also know that at least one genus, Patagorhynchus, was alive in South America at the end of the Cretaceous, so perhaps they had a presence throughout Gondwana. Either way, they survived like the marsupials and placentals through the KPG extinction event. But while other mammals spread across the globe and evolved to become the dominant land animals from now on, monotremes basically kept to themselves. They probably never went past Australia and New Guinea during the Cenozoic. It may seem that they were outcompeted in all niches besides the one they were in, and to be fully transparent, that's what I used to think too, but this is not true. In reality, they simply fit their niche so well that they face no competition and no drive to do anything else. Marsupials may rule Australia today, 
but they've rarely specialized for semi-aquatic niches the way these egg-laying mammals did, likely because they'd have to work around water entering their pouch. As we'll see in a bit, their ancient lineage modified for this semi-aquatic life has shaped much of what these mammals are like today. People like to say that animals are weird as if they're freakish or lesser, and that's simply not true. Every species is taking what their evolutionary history gave them and finding a way in the world. It's their own normal. With that said, monotremes are genuinely so weird, and I love them for it. They're not just weird for mammals, they're entirely unique varieties of weird. Perhaps the weirdest animals that have ever lived on the face of the earth. And this conviction has only strengthened in my mind as I kept looking into them. There's a lot to cover, so let's do this. We have here a model of the ancestral monotreme from our test animation in the first video we made, brought to life by all these lovely creators. I'm going to draw over and highlight different parts of the body as I go along, so hopefully it's a little easier to follow. So, with all that said, buckle in. Yes, they lay leathery eggs like a lizard or a crocodile from which their young hatch. But it's believed that most mammals and mammal relatives laid eggs before evolving to give live birth. So this is not particularly weird. Mammals are often thought of as entirely warm-blooded or endothermic, as opposed to cold-blooded or ectothermic animals like reptiles and fish. Monotremes are neither. They're mesothermic being able to maintain a constant body temperature which is lower than that of other mammals. Other mesotherms include tuna and leatherback sea turtles. They can also go into a state of torpor to save energy in lean times, much like how a crocodile can fast in its burrow for months without food. Now onto the skeleton. They have a sprawled limb posture, like reptiles, as well as a unique pectoral girdle derived from basal synapsids like dimetrodon and gorgonopsids. They also have epipubic bones on their hips, serving as attachments for the muscles of the hind limbs, similar to marsupials. Their skulls are shallow and long, with a more pronounced premaxilla, lacking the architecture for the recognizable mammalian snout. Their teeth are tribosphenic, convergent with therian mammals, and somewhat homogeneously shaped front teeth so no canines or incisors. Male monotremes, especially the male platypus, have venomous spurs modified from one of the bones of their ankles. These extremely painful weapons are used to spar for mating opportunities. Because of course the ladies always want to see combat and never want to have someone willing to listen, obviously. Speaking of listening, let's talk about their brain and their senses. Despite the hemispheres of their brain being disconnected from each other, they've shown similar cognitive abilities like problem solving and memory retention as other mammals like cats and rodents. And then there's the subject of their eyes. This is where I must emphasize again that I am not a scientist. This is what I interpreted from the studies that I read. So stay with me. For context, most animals, including monotremes, have two types of cells to sense light on the retinas of their eyes rods, which tell light from dark, and cones to sense color. Monotremes today are monochromatic, meaning they can't see color at all. However, genetic analysis shows that they have the genes necessary to see three different kinds of color, red, green, and blue. Perhaps the ancient ancestors of monotremes were trichromatic, like humans and other primates, which is very unique amongst mammals. Amazingly, however, it goes even deeper. They also have an inactive gene that in other animals like birds and fish is responsible for ultraviolet vision. Again, modern monotremes probably don't have this ability, but perhaps their ancestors once did. One thing they do still have today are double cone cells, which are able to see polarized light. This makes sense as echidnas are able to distinguish vertical versus horizontal patterns very keenly. Their exact purpose is unclear but perhaps it gives them an advantage when seeing through water, a medium affected by polarized light. Very likely, egg-laying mammals like the platypus and echidna see the world in a totally different way than us. Yet amazingly, seeing is likely not that important of a sense for them. Their hearing is good, but they have no external ears, or pinnae, 
In fact, when they dive, they cover their eyes and ears with a facial fold to protect them, sort of like a built-in visor. Even their nostrils close underwater. In short, they don't use sight, sound, or smell underwater. Instead, they rely on an entirely unique organ, their bill. Despite being called the duckbill platypus, the bill is not much like a duck's at all. It's not hard from keratin, but covered in soft, leathery, glandular skin. This bill is lined with thousands of sensory organs of two types, push rods and electroreceptors. Push rods sense vibrations and touch to a degree that makes whiskered animals like cats and seals jealous, able to sense extremely minor disturbances in the surrounding water. But it's the electroreceptors that are really special. Monotremes are some of the only mammals that can sense electricity, along with the Guyana dolphin. It's a sense more common in fish, like stingrays and sharks. So if the past few minutes of crazy eyeballs and venom type angles have not convinced you that monotremes are weird, this might do it. Specifically, these mammals can sense the electrical impulses released by the muscle activity of their prey. Everything from a twitching limb to a beating heart. Not only are these senses of vibration and electricity very sharp on their own, they overlap to provide an unprecedented view of the world for these animals. The tiny organs are arranged in alternate rows on the bill's top and bottom. The electroreceptors can tell what direction a signal is coming from, while the mechanoreceptors can tell how far away the signal is. The longer the delay between electric and pressure stimuli, the farther away it is. It's basically the biological version of a mini-map, and allows for the platypus, and the echidna to a lesser extent, to find food with uncanny accuracy. So once they find food, how do they eat? Whether you're looking at living toothless species or toothed ancestors, they both have a striking absence in their anatomy. Monotremes as a group often prey upon aquatic invertebrates, whose shells are made of calcium carbonate. Combine this chemically basic material with something like stomach acid, and the stomach acid becomes neutralized, meaning they can't digest their own food. It's for this reason, like many mollusk-eating fish, that monotremes have lost the use of their stomachs entirely. They just don't have stomachs, like seriously. Instead, they must very intensively chew their food in their mouths before it goes straight to the intestines. And once food is done and discarded, it goes through the cloaca, an opening for both excretion and reproduction. In fact, that's where monotremes get their name. It means one hole. I literally led with this, but I might as well elaborate. Monotremes usually lay between one and three small leathery eggs, hatching in about 10 days while incubated by the mother in a small burrow. The tiny young, which are called puggles, yes, really, hatch with the help of an egg tooth, which is basically a keratin growth from the maxilla bone of the snout, much like a bird or lizard hatching with its egg tooth before it falls off a little later. Like all other mammals, monotremes nurse their babies with milk. Unlike all other mammals, they don't have nipples to nurse their young. Instead, they have milk patches, which are basically patches of skin that ooze milk upon application of pressure, such as a baby pressing its snout to feed. Eventually, the young grow old enough to leave the nest and make their own way in the world. But they'll always have a small gift within themselves. Lots of sex chromosomes, it turns out. Placental mammals like us have two sex chromosomes, one from the mother, one from the father. But monotremes have ten, five from the mother and five from the father. And somewhere in that genome, the platypus at least, carries the DNA coding for a trait seen in a few other mammals, but that is amazing nonetheless, biofluorescence. In 2020, scientists looked at the taxidermy specimens of the platypus held at the University of Nebraska State Museum. When they shined a black light on them, they found that these egg-laying mammals, much like flying squirrels and opossums, have a teal-colored glow to their fur. They don't make their own glow, like a firefly, but rather absorb some frequencies of light, such as sunlight, and reflect it back into the ultraviolet range, outside of human perception. The exact purpose of this has not been discerned, but if it turns out they can see UV light after all, maybe they use it as a communication device. If not, 
They could also use it as a defense from predators that can see UV light, such as predatory birds and crocodiles. Okay, that was an absolute truckload, but hopefully that offers some of the most important information about monotremes as a group and their extremely unique biology. So, where are monotremes in our timeline? Commonly seen as primitive or a living fossil, there is only one species of platypus on Earth, and it's a river-dwelling invertebrate hunter found only in Australia and Tasmania. Echidnas exist in four known species, found throughout Australia, Tasmania, and New Guinea. They're covered in thick, sharp quills used for defense, and they're myrmecophages, meaning they only feed on ants and termites, like an anteater or aardvark. These walking sea mines probably arose sometime between 50 and 15 million years ago, having evolved from a platypus-like, semi-aquatic ancestor. In fact, a lot of the echidna's weirder traits are due to them being secondarily terrestrial, that is, adapted to life on land after living in the water. This is practically unprecedented in evolution. It'd be like a seal turning its flippers back into legs. And like a seal turning its flippers back into legs, the echidna's hind feet face backwards all the time. As hinted before, they actually retain their electroreception, but it's very faint since it doesn't work as well in air compared to water. Overall, it just feels like nothing really resembling these animals exists on our planet anymore. That makes it especially tragic when you realize the way our own species is treating them. As a result of habitat destruction and invasive species brought to Australia by European settlers, four of the five monotreme species are threatened with extinction. The platypus is near threatened, one species of echidna is vulnerable, and two more are critically endangered, with the Attenborough's long echidna only being found alive again in 2023 after going undocumented for 62 years. I would not feel comfortable talking about these animals for so long without mentioning the state that they're in right now. So I've linked a couple of conservation projects in the description below. You can learn more and possibly lend some support there. Monotremes are, in my opinion, among the most distinctive and marvelous animals in natural history. With many animals, you can make some sort of comparison with another group, related or unrelated, and see the similarities between them. But these mammals are such a finely tuned hodgepodge of traits and adaptations, with such a long history. They stand apart from the rest of the animal kingdom. They've been around for hundreds of millions of years, survived through dramatic and even catastrophic changes and lived alongside stupendous menageries of neighbors. They're not just well adapted, they're well lived. But as someone interested in speculative evolution, I can't help but wonder about what could have happened if things had gone differently. They've had to endure not only in the shadow of the dinosaurs, but more so the other mammals. Our timeline is dominated by marsupial and placental mammals of all sorts. They've filled almost every large animal niche, exploring every sort of lifestyle and body plan imaginable. Meanwhile, monotremes have continued as always, content with their narrow path through deep time. It works well, but imagine if their peculiarities were, in fact, the norm. What if they had no competitors to be forced aside by, and could not only endure through one calamity after the next, but realize possibilities undreamt? In the next video, we will discuss how the timeline of Age of Monotremes splits off from our own and what these unique creatures could become. Special thanks to all of our supporters on Patreon, including our ancestor tier supporters listed here. If you would like to support our pitch for a speculative evolution animated show and get some cool exclusive rewards, check out our Patreon. Also, subscribe, like, hit the bell, and comment to stay in the loop about a world ruled by egg-laying mammals. Thank you all so much for watching, and we'll see you next time.